Welcome. This webinar is brought to you by the New Hampshire Training Institute on Addictive Disorders. You can access the recording of this webinar at our website at www.nahatica.org. After completing this webinar, please upload and complete the quiz. If you are interested in receiving a certificate, you can find the quiz in the file pod throughout this presentation on our website at nahatica.org, or you can email traininginstitute at nahatica.org. You can email, mail, or fax the completed quiz. Contact information is on the quiz itself. If you're a member of Nahatica or NADAC, the certificate for this webinar is free. If you aren't a member, the fee is $15. You will receive a certificate worth one CE once you have completed and passed the quiz and paid for the webinar. Through the New Hampshire Training Institute on Addictive Disorders, this one-hour event is pre-approved by the New Hampshire Board of Licensing for Alcohol and Other Drug Use Professionals, as well as the NBCC. If you have any trouble viewing this webinar, audio problems, or have any technical questions, please contact us at 603-225-7060. Please email any questions regarding the material you see today to traininginstitute at nahatica.org. You can find and upload these introduction slides in the pile of pod to the right of your screen. And with that, I'm going to turn you over to Becky Ireland to talk about environmental management strategies for substance use prevention today. Great, thank you so much. I'm excited to be able to speak with you today about a prevention strategy which I believe very um, fondly in. It is environmental management strategies for substance use prevention. And this particular strategy aims to impact the influences on individuals' substance use behaviors. We know that some individuals have individual factors which may make them at increased use for substance use disorders, whether it be genetic or other issues, as well as learned behaviors. But for many, but for many people, there are environmental influences which will impact their substance use choices and potentially progression to a substance use disorder. Environmental management strategies are based on the public health approach, which was founded in the mid-1800s in London by a Dr. Snow. They were in the middle of a cholera outbreak, and Dr. Snow, as well as many doctors, were growing frustrated with having to treat sick individuals without understanding how or why it was getting transmitted. At that point, they did not understand the germ model of disease and thought that there was something going on in the air. Dr. Snow began putting pins in maps to show where people were getting sick. After some time, he noticed that they were all clustered around one particular well. He hypothesized that there was something in the well that was making them sick, so he went to some of the local counselors and asked that the handle from the well be removed to see if people stopped getting sick. And lo and behold, after the handle was removed, cholera cases dropped dramatically and eventually subsided. They later found out that cholera was, in fact, water transmitted, and Dr. Snow, by having the well shut down, had helped save many lives. He was one of the founders of epidemiology. And that particular public health model says that there are agents, hosts, and environments, and that when these three things interact with each other, the result is disease. An agent is typically the thing that is making someone ill or transmitting the disease. The host is the individual who becomes ill and contracts a disease or develops a disorder. The environment is where all of those meet. We can think about this as the common flu or common cold and things like door handles or other public spaces where a germ is present, someone comes in contact with it at that particular place, which is the environment, and they may get sick. The same can be said for substance use. It is impacted by the environment, and if we're going to truly make an impact on this disease, we must really take a look at what, what's happening in the environments where people are living, learning, working, and playing 
and how we can make impacts to those environments which will reduce the occurrence of substance use behaviors. Environmental management strategies are considered a prevention strategy. However, I really encourage us all to think of it as a strategy that cuts across the continuum of care. Whether it be someone who has never used a substance before, someone who has chosen to be an abstainer, someone who is trying to cut back on their substance use, or someone who has gone through treatment and or trying to sustain their recovery and avoid triggers, we're all sharing the same environment. The FACE Project, a nonprofit that spent almost 25 years trying to educate around the issue of alcohol use, created a poster and a saying and a story about a fish cannot be blamed for being sick when swimming in a polluted stream. And the same can be true when it comes to young people who are trying to swim in our society and an environment with lots of different factors which will support their substance use and promote their substance use. And that's what we're going to spend time talking about today is what is going on in the environment that impacts people's substance use choices. When we talk about environment today, I'd like you to think about it not just in the green environmental movement frame such as recycling, water quality, think of it instead as places where people live, learn, work, and play. Those may be locally, those may be in an organization, they could be regionally at the state or New England district, they could be national or global. These environments could be built places like buildings, they could be natural places like counties surrounded by mountains. They may be political or policy driven in nature, and in today's technology age, where media and music and technology are a great source of communication and information sharing, the environment is also technology-based. It's important for us to remember that people don't make their own choices in complete isolation from other people in their lives. Humans naturally are social creatures. And we look to what others around us are doing to help guide our behavior. Our perception about what others are doing are called social norms. We also look at what attitudes the people around us have on certain topics or issues. In some cases, we use those and adapt those to be our own attitudes or help guide us in deciding what our own attitudes are. We all have perceptions, and at times those perceptions are accurate. Other times they're flawed. And others may oftentimes have behavioral expectations for individuals. And those behavioral expectations from others can also influence behaviors. Our goal in prevention is to figure out how we can create social norms, attitudes, perceptions, and behavioral expectations in the general population which will help discourage substance use. When we start thinking about substance use as a population disease issue, we need to start thinking about it in the public health frame of the socio-ecological model. A simpler way of calling these are spheres of influences. One way to think of it, if you look at the screen at the top, is an individual. That individual goes through its life for many people surrounded by family. And the family is the first sphere of influence that guides us from a young age about what we think, feel, act, and believe in the world. Peers also become an influence. Institutions, this could be everything from a school to an employer to an organization someone is affiliated with. And our community is made up of many different institutions and families. So that's the next layer out on the sphere of influence. Our communities are all driven by public policy, whether it be at the town, county, state, national, or global level. There are public policies which drive our choices and guide people's decision making based upon if they believe in the consequences of violating those public policies. We also have things like media and culture. 
This could be everything from music to religion, to movies, to television, to print media, to web media, that all are funnels of information that affect our public policy, our communities, our institutions, our peers, our families, and the individuals who are making choices. When we want to address the issue of substance use disorders and substance use prevention in our society, we need to really force ourselves to think about the issue, not just at the individual basis, but across all the spheres of influence and think about how what we do on one layer will impact the layers in either direction. That thought about how to impact those layers and the influencers as well as the influences on individual substance use choices is what environmental management is. Environmental management is not a standalone prevention strategy, as is the case with most prevention strategies. The research is very clear that prevention strategies, when implemented as part of a comprehensive and evidence-based approach, are most effective at preventing substance use, and environmental management is no different. We're going to pause for a discussion question. According to the epidemiology triangle public health model, which of the following is the agent? Is the agent the place where disease occurs? Is it the thing which causes disease? Is it the person who becomes ill? Or is it none of the above? Take the time to record your answer. Again, the agent. Is it the place where disease occurs? The thing which causes disease? The person who becomes ill? Or none of the above? If you need more time, you may pause. Environmental management really is just one piece of a broader prevention pie. There are many different types of prevention strategies. Typically, they fall into three main categories. Education, environmental management, and early intervention. Education is when you try to provide individuals, groups, or entire populations with information that will help them make choices around their health behaviors. It's things such as educating them on the risks and harms of using a substance, educating them about skills such as refusal skills or coping skills for stress they can use rather than turning to substance use. Environmental management is what we're talking about here today where we really try to affect where people are living, learning, working, and playing so that those areas are supporting their choices that around health, safety, and success, such as limiting substance use. Early intervention is considered a prevention strategy in that you are trying to get someone to make some different choices before they've progressed to a situation of developing a substance use disorder or having experienced negative outcomes from their substance use behaviors. When you put all of these things together, that is a comprehensive approach. For many people, Prevention is about focusing on the education and environmental management factors so that we can prevent someone from ever progressing in their substance use behaviors to the point where early intervention services, such as screening or referral to treatment, are needed. Some big differences between individual strategies and environmental strategies is that really we cannot ask people to make choices such as saying no to substance use if they are getting messages bombarded at them in their daily life that are saying yes use, whether it be TV commercials, printed signs talking about alcohol specials or brands, whether it be signs about tobacco use, people using 
graphics on their clothing which promote substance use. References in movies and music, videos about substance use on YouTube and other websites that people use to get information and entertainment from. We don't want to create a dynamic where we pin the individual strategies against the environmental strategies because both are very important. We need individuals to be educated and to be thinking about risk factors, protective factors, what the harms are, what the risks are in doing something, what their reasons for not wanting to use are, and what their coping strategies and skills are to help them make choices other than using substances. But with that said, when these people have those skills and that information and they go out into the world, if they're getting conflicting messages, that may be what sends them into a decision to use. We need to think about this as there are many fence sitters when it comes to substance use. People that may use, people that may not use, and they're sitting on that fence trying to decide if they're going to use a substance or not. It's the environment that may make the difference between if they use or don't use. And again, this may be people who have never used before. This may be people who are making an effort to cut back on their use of a substance or have gone through some form of formal treatment or are trying to sustain recovery. And the environment could be the difference between if they are able to sustain those changed behaviors or if they revert back to previous behaviors that they really hoped to change. When we look at the environment, there are many factors that impact substance use. One of the biggest is that there is a widespread cultural belief in the United States that alcohol and other drug use is normal and accepted and in some cases expected as part of being an adult or functioning in life, or coping with stresses, or having fun. We also are a society which has aggressive promotions sent at us, and these promotions often glorify the benefits of a substance, rather than talking about what the negative harms and risks are that are associated with use. And these promotions often play on emotions and humor and at times are even marketed towards young children through the use of cartoon characters. You couple aggressive promotions with the fact that substances are relatively abundantly available in the United States and are relatively inexpensive, especially when it comes to alcohol. The low cost of some of these substances is something that reduces a barrier many people otherwise would have to using the substance and it makes it that much more accessible for them. In many parts of the country there are inconsistently enforced laws and policies when it comes to substance use whether it be tobacco, alcohol, or other drugs. If someone is unsure that they will be held accountable or caught for a substance use behavior they may take a chance that they otherwise would not take. Another factor is unstructured free time, and that that unstructured free time is a, something people use to try to figure out what they're going to do with their time, and because of the abundantly available, inexpensive substances that are heavily promoted and glorified as having positive outcomes from use, Sometimes people will often turn to the substances as a way to have a good time. To combat all of these factors, environmental management tries to really get at certain aspects. The number one aspect is availability of substances. And not just the substances, but also the items that are related to use. This could be everything from rolling paper for certain smokable drugs to drinking games that are marketed and sold in stores or other paraphernalia that is used and widely available, not just in places that are specialized stores, but sometimes also integrated into stores 
where families and young children go just to get essentials such as food and clothing. The pricing and promotion of substances is an aspect of environmental management which it also takes a close look at. Understanding what the marketers have known for years, which is the pricing and promotion of substances, is the difference between the volume of sales and the number of customers. As price goes down, use goes up. As promotion goes up, use goes up, and the number of customers goes up. So by environmental management, taking a look at the pricing and promotion of substances, it can impact not only volume of sales, but also the number of people engaged in substance use. Relevant policies, laws, and their enforcement, norms and attitudes around substance use. Both of these aspects have an important consideration in that these are areas which many people have differences between what they perceive to be the reality and what the actual reality is. When it comes to policies and laws, people may feel like they are not enforced when you're talking to people in the public because they feel like people are getting let off or that they're never being caught. But when you talk to law enforcement, they sometimes have a different side of the story, which is when they do catch them, they are trying to address it. Same thing with norms and attitudes around substance use, especially amongst young people and adults when they think about what's going on with the young people. There is an actual social norms marketing approach which tries to correct the difference between what is perceived and what is actual. Teens tend to grossly overestimate how much their peers are using and adults often underestimate how much, how many teens are using. So it's a fine balancing act, but trying to get people to understand that there may be a difference between what they think is going on and what is actually going on. Another aspect of environmental management is alternatives to use. This doesn't mean that you need to run after school programs as a preventionist. In fact, many of our funding sources are not allowed to be used for this. When we think about environmental management, it is not always about creating new things and offering programs. It's about taking a look at what is going on in the area, the place, and the environment that may be keeping people from utilizing the alternatives that already exist. Is it socially driven that they don't engage? Are there barriers such as location or transportation or cost? Those are all things to think about with environmental management that doesn't mean you have to be the one to offer the program. When we look at changing environments, there are typically three common areas of breakdown that are not specific to any one community and tend to be very common across communities, states, and the country. For one, we know that norms can be unclear to people about what is acceptable. And that when young people are not sure what's acceptable from their peers or from the adults in their life, they be, may be more likely to try things to find out what is acceptable and what the consequence for that choice is. There are actual norms, and then there are norms that are expressed and communicated. Especially among teenagers, we often hear stories that part of the reason they feel everyone is using is people have stories they're talking about. But when you dig a little deeper with students in focus groups, you often find out that they may talk about a situation when they were using a substance, but that situation may have only happened once and it may have happened years ago, but they're still telling it as if it recently happened. There's also norms that are as perceived. There's an interesting dynamic where there's a silent majority when it comes to teens and substance use, and perhaps even in the broader society. Individuals who are not using or only using a small amount think they are alone in that and that everybody else is using. But when you look at the survey data, which has been consistent over years and decades, we find out that really that is not the case. And so what we end up is we have a silent majority of individuals who think they're alone 
when they are the majority who are making choices not to use substances. We think about availability. And it doesn't matter if this is tobacco or alcohol, if your state has any form of legalized marijuana or prescription drugs. There's retail availability, and there's also social availability. Retail availability is when a person goes to a business to purchase that particular substance. And social availability is when someone they know gives it to them. When we look at teen surveys, consistently, social availability is the number one way young people say they got alcohol the last time they drank. That's something for us to think about when we start talking about what are some of the strategies to do in an environment to address availability of substances. Another example would be if someone is in recovery and their particular grocery store has large displays of alcohol the second they walk in the front door, you then have a situation where the retail promotion and availability of a product has that substance right in the face of someone who chooses not to use and may have that substance be a trigger for them. Regulations are also an area where the environment regularly breaks down in communities and states. Having laws, policies, guidelines, and rules, whether it be at the community level or the organizational level, such as a school or a workplace, are fine. The problem is, is that many times people may not know they exist, or the way they were designed does not really get at the root of how young people or the people who are interacting with those organizations or locations are using a substance. So regulations really are impacted by how they're designed, how they're communicated. Do people know about them? Are they reminded about them consistently enough where it's on the forefront of their decision making? Do people truly understand what is being said? Or is it legalese where they don't understand exactly what's allowable and what's not allowable? And confusion about what's allowable and not allowable can further be muddied if they're unsure that they're being enforced the way they should be. If someone sees a policy that's consistently being broken and the people who are breaking it have little to no visible accountability, right there that is information the person may take into consideration in making their own choices around substance use. Social norms, it's important to remember that they occur at all levels. Individuals have assumptions and perceptions about what is a social norm around substance use. Families may have their own about how what's okay with some parents and is that okay with me. And they may not be accurate. They may think all parents let their teens drink when the reality is that's not the case. Evidence exists that correcting people's misperceptions can lead to behavior change, and this strategy is called social norms marketing. I encourage you to spend some time looking into that if it's of interest to you. It basically has you report back the actual norms when you have good reason through focus groups or conversations to believe that there is a widespread misperception and that people are overestimating how much an undesired behavior is happening and you want to help give that silent majority a voice and show them they're not alone. You can use social norms marketing for that. Reducing availability is another sample strategy area for environmental management of substance use disorders. When we think about reducing availability, just a reminder that there are social sources of availability and there are also retail sources of availability. Compliance checks, vendor education programs, which are things such as responsible beverage seller server trainings, which oftentimes are abbreviated as RBS. Again, that's responsible beverage seller server programs. Those are trainings which try to make sure people understand what the laws are and their responsibilities, as well as how they can help make sure that alcohol 
or other age-restricted products are sold in a manner that complies with the law and public safety. There can be programs such as Sticker Shot, which are stickers which go on products in a retail environment and remind the purchaser and the public about things such as the fact that it's illegal to provide alcohol to people under 21. That is a retail-based point-of-sale initiative, but it also gets at social hosting. As we said, social hosts are the number one way young people report getting their alcohol. So doing programs which try to get at this belief that hosting someone underage is the best thing for them because it keeps them safe and keeps them off the road. There's a lot of great education that can be done to the public about the fact that there are a lot of other dangers that come from teen substance use or substance use other than just intoxicated driving. You can do education and training for people around social hosts and furnishing. You can also have conversations with people about how they're storing prescription drugs and other substances in their home, as well as how they're disposing of them when they no longer want them. So for example, campaigns about locking up alcohol, other drugs or prescription drugs, as well as things like drug take back days are all strategies that reduce availability. Examples of tobacco policy initiatives that have happened, many of them have happened over the past decade, are tobacco-free school policies, policies that prohibit tobacco use in public places, especially where young people and families congregate, such as playing fields, beaches, not allowing smoking in cars with children, having smoke-free workplaces, and even tobacco taxes, which aim to collect higher taxes and in turn drive up the price of a product, which we know can make price-sensitive consumers less able to purchase and use the product. Similarly with alcohol, there have been many policy initiatives that have taken place, public possession and intoxication laws. The minimum drinking age, which at one point was turned back to 18 and that turned out to show the public that there's a lot of protection and public safety benefits to having a drinking age of 21. Laws around things like providing alcohol to the minors, operating under the influence, as well as some more indirect policy initiatives such as things which deal with noise, so local noise ordinances. Some communities have to have property owners register large gatherings. Those are all initiatives which are policy driven and can help get at substance use and some of the ways that substance use behaviors impact not only the users but the community as a whole. Putting these environmental management strategies into action takes careful consideration and to go through steps that substance abuse prevention specialists are very familiar with. The federal SAMHSA's strategic prevention framework model is really a guiding principle for the work of prevention specialists across this country and as a best practice for substance abuse prevention. This model says that there are some key components what everyone should do is it carries out prevention science. We always want to do an assessment, get to know what the problem really is and not based upon our assumptions. Once we have an idea what the problem is, we really need to think about what our capacity is to address it. Who do we need at the table? What do we need for resources? What are some challenges and barriers we might be up against and are we able to overcome them? We need to come up with our action plan and our planning for what we're going to do when we're going to do it and make sure we have all our preparations in place. Moving then into implementation. And sometimes we start to implement something and realize that we were wrong about some aspect of our capacity or our planning, or there was something we hadn't thought about during the assessment to look at. And we get new information or a new experience that then we need to move backward in the cycle, and that's okay. It's a fluid process. 
but after implementation, okay, the important thing is to really evaluate what went well. And a key about evaluation is that you really cannot wait to the very end to do it. Part of evaluation is taking a look at the data you have during the assessment process and figuring out what data you will need to measure the impact and to find ways to start collecting that before you begin implementing. So that as you implement, you will get the information and data you need to help measure the impact of your work and to also drive process improvement. Because environmental management strategies typically are not one-shot deals. They're typically strategies that need to be sustained over time. And that brings us to the center of the strategic prevention framework model around sustainability and cultural competence. These sections indicate that as we go through the entire process and everything we do, there really needs to be some thoughtful considerations about how are we going to keep what we're doing going in the long run so that we're not just doing something and walking away from it before we realize the true impact, or worse, before we make an impact and then present our community with a situation where it's going to then go back to the way it was before. Cultural competence, whether it be everything from race and ethnicity to socioeconomic status to reading levels and language, all of those things are important considerations as you carry out your work. When you're dealing with environmental management strategies, you tend to be dealing with populations as a whole or large groups of individuals. So certainly understanding what are some of the different cultural components that are going on within those populations and what adjustments can be made so that anyone who interacts with the strategy you're trying to implement has the best chance possible for it having the intended impact. The assessment of the environment really should be a snapshot. Assessment shouldn't be seen as something that you do once, you check off your list and say, I'm done. It really needs to be somewhat ongoing on a regular basis. Things change over time, especially with the environment. There may be things completely unrelated to your work that could create a change in the environment. Perhaps there are new individuals in positions of power. Perhaps there's a new business that comes into town. Perhaps there's a new movie or song or thing at the mass cultural level that impacts the society's views on substance use. All of those things by doing regular snapshots and assessments of the environment help make sure you're on the right track and allow you to be responsive to changing needs of the community or the population. The types of assessments that are typically done are environmental scans. These are when people take a look at what's going on in their community, and we'll talk more about that. There's also things like community mapping exercises. That's when people literally start drawing their community and thinking about what is going on that might be impacting our citizens' views and behaviors perceptions and attitudes around substance use. There's also survey data and other data sources such as enforcement data that are quantitative in nature, but you need to couple that also with your qualitative data. That's more of the stories and the examples and the anecdotes that you might get from things such as focus groups and key informant interviews. These are the things that when put together help bring the numbers to life and give real-world examples of what the numbers are trying to tell us or dig deeper than the numbers allow us to go on their own surface level. Environmental scans are literally asking people who are affiliated with your community to go out into the places where the people that you are trying to change the behaviors in are spending their time and looking at what are the things, whether they be signs or outward use of substance use in public spaces or beer cans everywhere or cigarette butts everywhere or drug dealers at certain corners. All of those things impact substance use, attitudes, behaviors, and perceptions. Environmental scan is an active process. It is not something that should be done in an office. And it is not something that should be done by a small handful of people. Really try to get representative samples 
of your population that you are trying to work with, as well as many different facets of the community. Having done these environmental scans with communities before, I can tell you it is a far richer experience. And everyone can learn from each other. And in addition to getting the information for the scan, it can also help strengthen community collaboration and communication amongst partners by going through this exercise, because they begin to teach each other what the reality is. There are two examples of environmental scans, but there may be others as well. Some I have used in the past and have been used widely across the country are the College Alcohol Risk Assessment and the Community Alcohol Personality Survey. You may Google both of those to be able to find the documents. This brings us to another discussion question. The prevention pie described in this course included the following pieces. Early intervention, environmental management, and what else? Was it alternative activities, enforcement, education, or none of the above? Take this opportunity to log your answer. So when you look at the prevention pie, the pieces are early intervention, environmental management, and lastly, education. And just as a reminder, all of those have to work together. Anyone in a standalone attempt to reduce substance use is going to be less effective than if you have a comprehensive web of strategies where they interact and build upon each other. When we look at available data to help do assessments, make sure to be creative and to talk with your partners about what they have that can really help paint that picture. Much like Dr. Snow used pins on a map to help figure out where the issues were and that that was what gave him the aha moment that it was all clustered around the well. You can do things like look at enforcement and emergency medical service or EMT data for where there are substance use related calls for service and start thinking about what's going on in that environment that is causing these clusters. You can look at where liquor licensees or tobacco licensees are clustered and how that impacts the use in those areas. You can look at things like where are the advertising pieces in our community? Are they print? Are they radio? Are they media? Are they roaming on things like vehicles or showing up at special community events? All of those things can help impact the overall advertising exposure that not only young people get, but even adults and sometimes people in recovery who really are trying hard not to use a substance. Court or juvenile justice cases and traffic data are also good sources of data as are the old standbys of things such as adult and student surveys, which have information on use, attitudes, and perceptions. Focus groups and key informant interviews are also important pieces. The important thing to remember about these is that you should do some with both your target audience that you're hoping to do the behavior change with, as well as with the community partners, such as police, school personnel, and businesses. When I've done focus groups around environmental management and figuring out what are, going, what are the things going on in a community that are impacting substance use, it has been really powerful to see that the community partners learn from each other, and that when you're able to put the target audience observations and information aside with the community partner things. It can either help show themes between the groups, common areas. It can also help show where there's a disconnect and different views between the group, two groups that then will allow you some actionable specific ways that you can make an impact. The questions during these focus groups, because if environmental management strategies is really one of the driving forces for doing these focus groups or key informant interviews as part of the needs assessment, is to make sure you're asking very specific questions about availability, pricing and advertising, actual and perceived enforcement 
norms and attitudes and alternatives to use, what the barriers are to alternatives to use, and what are the support systems that help people make lower risk choices. It's important to not use leading questions, but to recognize that for the average person, they're not going through their day thinking about how the availability of a substance impacts their behavior. They're not thinking about pricing or how much advertising they're exposed to. They may be having their assumptions about enforcement norms and attitudes, but without having very specific questions, they may not get to the heart of the issues that will help you figure out what are the areas that you can most make an impact and take action around. Once you've done a needs assessment, Capacity building is key. Oftentimes, after you go through the needs assessment and you've really talked to community partners about what is going on in the environment that they work in, and in many cases, they live in as well. They may have their own family or nieces and nephews or neighbors that they care about in these areas. That all of those things come together and by involving them in the needs assessment, and involving them in capacity building and giving them some training early can help create a community dynamic where everyone is beginning to think about the environment. Many a times we've done training for people about environmental management and have them start doing some environmental scans or even see the results of the environmental scans, including things like pictures that were taken during those environmental scans. And it's amazing how much people start noticing things that they were tuned out to before their involvement in the scans or in the capacity building and training. There may very well be times where different members of the community and the group that comes together don't see eye to eye. And that's where ground rules and goals are very important to help make sure that people can disagree respectfully and look for the win-win situations where people can agree. Planning is an important part. Changing an environment is not something that happens overnight, and it's not something that one person can do alone in an unprepared fashion. It's important to, especially if you're new to environmental management, start thinking about what can be changed most immediately. What are the short-term wins that might help lay the foundation and momentum for future work that perhaps takes more time or is a little bit more challenging? It may also be that right now the human or fiscal capacity is not there to take on some very large things like policy change. But if your group can start taking on things like wanting to see less alcohol advertisement or tobacco advertisement outside stores in your community, sometimes those can be the small wins that will then build collaboration, communication, and teamwork in a community that can yield better and more large environmental changes. It's also important to try to think about what are your challenges, what are your barriers. Try to be proactive in figuring out how to address those things before you're faced with them unexpectedly. Implementation. As I've said, environmental change takes time and it also takes teamwork. It's not something that one person should try to do alone. Get youth involved, get parents involved, get people from the community that are respected. Let them know what's going on. Open their eyes to what aspects of the environment are influencing people's attitudes and behaviors around substance use. Give them information and get them on board so that all of you together can help look for opportunities and implement efforts when you see them. Part of implementing environmental management strategies is you can have all the plans, but sometimes things pop up unexpectedly, both challenges as well as opportunities. So if there's a town councilor, for example, who suddenly wants to do an ordinance around requiring responsible beverage seller server training or signage for liquor licensees, make sure you're prepared to jump on that and support them in the information they need to make decisions around that matter. If you're federally funded as part of a prevention project, you may not be able to take place in policy change initiatives. However, providing information to people and decision makers, especially if they ask you for it, is certainly allowable and considered education. Remember with environmental management to take the long view and celebrate 
the small successes. Celebrating the small successes will help keep the momentum. Thank people who participate, recognize people who participate. Evaluating, as we said earlier, is an important thing to think about throughout all of the steps. Look at what data was available during the needs assessment. If there are things you wish you had had but didn't have during the needs assessment, perhaps there's ways you can start collecting it before implementation and during implementation so that you then can measure change over time. When you're talking about environmental change, never underestimate that visuals and pictures speak volumes. It's very hard for people to argue with a picture. So if people are out doing environmental scans or they see something that's concerning, especially in the day and age of cell phones where people have cameras on them at almost all times, encourage them to take a photo of it. That way you can put together the photos and show the magnitude of ways that the society is having things from the environment influence them, whether it be people selling or dealing drugs, pricing and promotion, perhaps it's that display in the grocery store right next to the candy, perhaps it's the football theme uh, substance use displays that you can't even get into the produce aisle without walking by. Whatever the situation is, if there's something that's concerning in the environmental scan, make sure to take a picture. Learn lessons as you go and use process improvement for the future. You'll always have an opportunity in an ever-changing environment to address something and perhaps even build on previous successes. One example would be a local coalition or a youth group may see something going on in their community and get a local ordinance passed to change that when it regards to access to substances. They then may get support and interest from other communities and try to make a state law out of it. Take what they've learned and work with them and have them help you figure out what worked in their community so that it can help you do the best job as you try to change the environment in your area. Don't become complacent with changes. Remember that times change, priorities change, and players change. And at any given moment, any of those may erode or stall changes you've been worked, working hard for. This isn't to discourage you. Again, this is about planning and it's about thinking. Don't put all your eggs in one particular area or one particular basket. Think about how to build more comprehensive support for any kind of community change that you are hoping to do. If it's something that involves the town council, also try to get your law enforcement, some of your business, some of your educators, your community members all on board, your civic organizations all on board. Because with the strength in numbers, you're more likely to weather any kind of challenges or obstacles that might come over time. And lastly, remember to motivate yourself and your partners to remain positive and passionate. This work is impactful and it does make a difference, and not just a difference with one person, but it can make a difference for a whole population. So keep at it and remember that the environment is a very powerful influence on substance use behaviors and making the changes at the environmental level can create widespread and lasting change. I appreciate your time. You will have a quiz to take within the files document and within the portal. Just a reminder to complete that quiz and upload your answers so that you may get your certificate of completion. Thank you.